publisher of O'Shaughnessy's, okay, the uh, paper of record of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, and Fred goes way back with uh, Dennis Perone and Terrence Hallinan and Prop 215, and he will lead on. Fred? Uh, I'd like to thank Dale and Ellen for um, arranging this event. We uh, means, a means a lot to all of us. A lot of hard work went into it with the graphics and the, getting this beautiful venue. The, um, the way I came into the picture, well, I was an old friend of Dennis's since the 70s, but um, in, in 96, I was working at UCSF editing the internal weekly a paper called Ta uh, Synapse. And um, I was supplementing my income by uh, freelancing, mo moonlighting for the Anderson Valley Advertiser and freelancing uh, better pay paying gigs when I could. And I was a divorced dad with kids in Sonoma, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to devote to the um, to Prop 215 campaign, but in the, in the early months of, of 96, Dennis asked me um, to get him, get involved as a, as a writer, and um, he felt excluded from the, uh, from the from the leadership of the of the campaign that he had really launched, and. I started hanging out with him at the club, which was then in, in a, um, a, quiet, a quiet state because uh, as, De as Dennis put it, he, he had been told not to, he said, can you imagine me being told not to talk to the media? But uh, I, I, got a, I got an assignment from the New Yorker to write about the, the Prop 215 campaign and I, interviewed uh, Todd Vickery in that context, and we hit it off very, very well. We became very close friends, wound up speaking basically every, every day for the, for the next uh, 10 or 11 years. And Todd was a, a doctor who understood cannabis. He had, um, he had gone down to Mexican, uh, Mexico as, as a uh, college student to try it out for himself after reading about it in a, in a, a reference to it in a pharmaceutical text. And then he couldn't find out anything more about it. The, the uh, professors would clam up. So he went down to Mexico and he tried it and he got, he got an understanding of what cannabis was. Um, this whole story is told in, in O'Shaughnessy's. The, um, this issue, when, it, when Todd died, we put out a special issue which made Maybe the closest thing he gets to a biography until somebody discovers his remarkable archives in the National Library of Medicine, which I'm sure it's only a matter of time until some ambitious PhD discovers that. But anyway, Todd went on to, uh, to really study the plant and study the pre-prohibition medical literature. He had a brief job with the um, with the, with an NIH, the government in in uh, in the 1980s, and he uh, got to the, hang out at the Library of Congress and the National Library of Medicine, where he would Xerox these old papers from the pre the pre prohibition era, and he was uh, he understood that the government was trying to use him as a as a kind of spy agent in, in dealing with young people. And he left that job, moved out to Berkeley, got a wonderful house in the Berkeley Hills, which you could do in those days, and um, became, a, became an activist. And finally, in, in 1995, it, that, 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 well, when Dennis started the Cannabis Buyers Club, that work began to, to really take on a new level of seriousness. And Todd was the medical advisor for Dennis's club, and he decided to write a, a, a paper, do a survey of who was visiting the club and what conditions they were using for now. As the, the short version of the history is said to all AIDS patients, and it's true that it was predominantly AIDS patients. 
But what Todd found out interviewing people was that people were also using for anxiety and for appetite, and, and well, that, that's AIDS related, but we're using for, well, he, he, he wrote out a, a, a paper with all the conditions that people are using for insomnia and epilepsy. And with that paper, which he could not get published in the medical literature, he had the, what, what he considered the basis, the medical basis for validating the, the approvals that he was um, writing for Dennis's patients. And if you, in the room right outside there, are some great pictures by a photographer named Rick Gerharder, who I think was shooting for the Bay Area Reporter back then. But one of those pictures is Todd and Dennis at the early version of the club interviewing patients. So we had real data on, on who was using for what. And it, was, it, it, it wasn't just AIDS patients. So then in 96, after the initiative passed, and he was ridiculed by General McCaffrey, Ethan Nadelman eloquently described this morning the press conference with Shalala and Janet Reno and, and Leshner from NIDA, and Todd was ridiculed by name. They had this graphic that said, Dr. McCaffrey's list of uh, Prop 215 Med medical conditions, and it um, it had f 15 conditions. One was migraine, misspelled. And the next morning, I got a, a, a fax from Todd at, at UCSF saying, whose list is this? It's not mine. And I looked into it and found out that an aide in McCaffrey's office had concocted the thing off, off the internet. And um, Todd was... Um, felt bad about being left off the suit that, that then followed the, the, the famous Conant decision. Abrahamson will be talking later about drafting it. And, and they won the important case and Nail said, we wouldn't be in this room if we, we didn't win it. That's true. It, was, it gave us the right under the First Amendment, gave doctors and patients the right to discuss marijuana under the First Amendment, freedom of speech. And um, Todd was Todd was hurt that he wasn't named as a co, co listed as a co plaintiff in that suit. There were about twenty five co plaintiffs, and I'm hoping that when Dan Abrahamson speaks in in the next panel, he'll explain the decision to leave Todd off that um, off that suit. And I'm, our, our next speaker is going to be um, Elvi Muzika. The although to, today in, in, in this is a very California centric and San Francisco centric version of our history, but there was a whole other. Um, hang on, just a sec, Elvi. Paul will t tell you when I'm through rapping. Uh, he, there was a Florida centric, Washington centric other side of the movement, and it was Robert Randall and got after a very long hard fight got a uh, federal approval to use on the compassionate use basis it was a glaucoma patient who got documented um, relief with marijuana and nothing else he was the first federal patient the second was a stock a stockbroker with a terrible bone disorder named urban rosenfeld and the third federal patient and still with us one of two survivors as far as i know because the bush administration cut off this compassionate program. Elvi Muzika. Yeah. <laughs> what an incredible thrill it is, and I want to thank all of you who put this event together 25 years ago and today. Yeah. It is such a joy to be reunited with my Canavic family. You are the largest segment of people I have ever run across. You are all over this beautiful world. You belong to every religion, to every politic I can think of. You are a real source of inspiration and power to this beautiful gift that we've been given, which we throw people in jail for using. Somebody's got to wake up. Federal prohibition really needs to end now, yesterday. Yeah. Congratulations, it's been so much fun. I knew nothing about this plan when a doctor said, if you don't start smoking marijuana, you will go blind. I 
when I was halfway there anyway, I'd be going with the genital cataract. I don't want those lies. Forget that. So I forgot all the lies they told me, and I tried it. And I didn't become a derelict. And I didn't become a drug addict. I'm still waiting for all these terrible things to happen to me. Thank God they never did. Thank God for liars, I guess. <laughs> the next part of my life was when it, I used to go to this Basketball Pamela Institute all the time, all those years. The only reason I was there is because a very brave doctor took my medical records and took me there. And then, of course, he was ridiculed because he was not following their protocols, and I was ignored and allowed to go blind when I, we already proved from the first day I spent at Basketball Pamela that marijuana was the only thing they had or I had or God had for me that could bring those interocular pressures from the 70s and high 60s down to 14 and 12. If that's not a miracle, that was the first thing I showed them. Did it do me any good? No, no. They, but they did help me get on the program after I made them keep records. And I said, keep this record. Some days when I'm doing well, I tell you, you know, it's going to be fine. I got some good marijuana last night of today. But if I didn't, everybody saw what happened. I tell them before it would happen. And I said, you got to keep those records because I'm doing something illegal. And sooner or later, I will go to jail. And when I go before a judge, I want this documentation. Who the shiver but they did it. <laughs> and that's exactly how it went. And thank God to people like all of you who were working for different parts of the country, differently, which you, we were all working towards the same thing. We are the chosen ones. California, I thank you. And everyone from wherever you came who has done anything to end this hideous prohibition that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. The um, movement also included dispensaries, as you know, and uh, Dennis's was not the only one that 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 opened. There was the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Club was crucial to us in the Bay Area. There were several others, and one of the early pioneers who'd been working with Dennis for five years on his club and building up the his his club and the Prop 215 campaign is with us today. And her club, man, although she was one of the six uh, enjoined by the Clinton administration. In, that, in those early days, along with Dennis and Jeff Jones of the Oakland Club, Lynette Shaw has kept the Fairfax facility going through thick and thin all these years, and she's here to tell you that incredible saga. I'm so, I'm so thrilled and happy to see everybody, many of whom I haven't seen for 25 years. I um, stumbled into the this, the whole thing. In 1990, I, I'm a musician and I had a band and I was selling pot on the side. I busted and beat up and went to jail for pot. Immediately afterwards, I met Jack Herer and uh, he gave me his book. And overnight, I wasn't crazy. I wasn't a criminal. I was a patient and I got beaten up for my medicine. And I was going to go to jail for my medicine on a POW. It was a POW. So Jack sent me to Dennis and Dennis said, Gee, you're awful quiet, Lynette, but you, I think you're photogenic. And so, uh, Want to come work for the club and be my straight white soundbite? <laughs> <laughs> and when I did what everybody would do for Dennis. Yes, Dennis, I'll help you. <laughs> so I joined the first staff in all history in the first Canvas Club in history. And um, and it was an astonishing. My mother was a Quaker. And what do you do when you have a drug war and you have critical people and you have people going to jail who are dying? And it was all the politics and all the, everything was going on. You hand out pot. If that's what stops the, the death and the pain and the suffering, that's what you do. And I already was a felon, so you know, <laughs> why not? So I worked for five years between Dennis and Jack. I was going back and forth to California, worked with Scott, worked with everybody, many of whom know his name, some of them know all the names. And um, I had a lot of support. I, I, I went to work for this kind gentleman you saw earlier here, and I was Jack's petition trainer. So I trained 215 petitioners all over the state of California for the campaign, and we won. And I had, in the meantime, I had opened up a illegal but necessary pot club in Fairfax where the Faithful Dead family was, and I had five members of the town council all in a green party. 
we had a lot of political support. We had a lot of moral support. And we also had the second highest HIV AIDS infections and then to this day, the highest breast cancer infections in the nation. So uh, I had this crisis going on, and so I started selling pot. And we got together collecting money. I went and got a pound because I'm a musician. I always do. And then after we won, the police chief contacted me and said, Lynette, I'm so happy you won because I have officers down. Do you know what a use permit is, lady? I said, no. Well, let me educate you. So I ended up writing the first, writing the first license and first use permit to legally sell cannabis in the world. And um, I was granted this unique license in 1997, which was, I was in Time Magazine. I was back in the major media. It was a big deal. So I got sued along with the other five people by, by President Clinton. And we were in federal court, civil court. I was singled out after a while as the test case to stop the licensed cannabis industry because I had the only license in the nation. So my case became the test case to stop the entire cannabis industry. And my, my lawyer, Greg Anton, bless his heart, stuck with me through thick and thin, fighting, 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 because the prosecution kept saying, well, this is the test case, and we have to get past Lynette Shaw to stop the rest of the cannabis industry. They started harassing me. I, I, one of the reasons that I apologized to everybody here, I had to disappear, because they knew that I knew everybody, they knew that I knew everybody. So I couldn't attend conferences because the agents were following. And they would want your driver's license. They would want your, your car vehicle descriptions. They wanted to know things. And they would hassle me. One of the reasons that Marin doesn't have any of the any of the cannabis clubs is that the feds invaded Marin County. It was bumper stickers. The U.S. out of Fairfax over us. And my landlord lost his $7 million piece of property for two years when Obama came in and seized the property because they couldn't get past me in court. So I lost my I lost my location, but I never lost my license because we did a good job and had helped everybody in the community and the town held my license in advance. So after 19 years, we finally beat them. I had been very quiet. I disappeared so everybody would go forward and go get licensed and go work in it and, and prove this. So when we went to court, there was 100,000 licenses across the nation. This is just in 2016. And we brought this issue up. Well, why can't Lynette have the license back? She needs to go back to work. And the prosecution said, we don't care what anyone else has. She just can't have a dispensary in open court. So my judge stood up furious and pointed the finger of shame at the prosecution from D.C. and said, don't you remember equal justice under the law? We knew we'd won our case. In fact, they had violated the Constitution, due process, equal justice under the law, my civil rights and common decency, which the judge acknowledged. And so I'm protected by the federal judge's orders to the DOJ cannot come after me or my license or my license dispensary and nobody else because of equal justice under the law. And now I'm back. Thanks, Linda. There were, uh, there were three doctors, three MDs on this panel. Um, and I, I I guess we ought to get hear from one of them. Dr. Micaria's successor at, at, at head of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. Well, I, I guess I should explain. Todd very much wanted to start a, a doctor's group. He did not um, fancy being the lone uh, advocate of, of cannabis among among his colleagues. And um, he... he Finally had enough, there were enough pro-cannabis doctors to form what he called the California Cannabis Research Medical Group in that winter of 99, 2000. And um, at some few years later, Phil Denny, one of the MDs in the group said, we don't, when people hear medical group, they think that means doctors practicing under the same roof. We really should change our name. And then it became the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. And today it's an international, Todd's, Group taught it, Jeff co founded in 99, 500 members worldwide, uh, bringing education uh, around, around the world. And um, Jeff's been a, a cannabis doc. Well, I'll, I'm going to let him tell his own story. He, he graduated from Brown, 
lived in a school bus for many years, went around the world with his kids, came back to Sonoma County where he practiced emergency medicine, had general practice, and then after Prop 215 passed, he began rethinking his, uh, his, uh, his career. I'll take it away, Dr. Jeffrey Hergenberg. Thank you for the introduction, Fred. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Dale and Ellen for putting this on, and I'm um, honored to be among the uh, panelists here today. Uh, these are the colleagues that I've been working with for, for many years. Uh, I wanted to briefly just talk about the caution and anxiety that I felt in my initial practice of cannabis medicine. I had left my ER medicine practice, and it was not without some real pangs of fear at times that I was going to get uh, either invaded and have my records stolen. I was locking up my records after a day's work. Uh, I wondered if, uh, if well, I was isolated by my medical community. Leaving ER medicine, you know, my doc friends were just kind of acting like, you're going to do what? And it was, it was uh, stepping out into a field that I was personally comfortable with and being part of this society of cannabis clinicians, Todd and, and uh, Beverly and Frank Cito and, you know, our, our group, we would get together and it was very comforting to be among a group of docs that understood the value of cannabis and, and even though we were under duress, it was, it was important for us to, to have some comfort together, not to mention the herb itself in bringing us comfort together. So there's this there's this um, uh, problem with the Medical Board of California. They still are not at all down for the law in California, and they have been attacking the docs all along. And I've, I've stood as an expert witness, and I said, it's a scary prospect. So in 1996 and on to 1999 at the time I opened my practice, I was feeling like I was really uh, stepping into into a hornet's nest because in the first 10 docs statewide that were really doing cannabis, visibly doing cannabis recommendations, half of them were being investigated by the medical board. And by the time there were uh, 18 of us doing cannabis recommendations, 11 had been uh, investigated by the medical board. That's that's scary. If you know, as a young doc with with a uh, with a family, four kids just getting into their 20s, uh, a mortgage to pay and so forth. If the med board wanted to take me on, they could surely find something because they, they trumped up charges and it didn't matter what they were bringing against you. It, was, it meant that you may lose your income, you may even lose your license, you may be put on probation. So the prospect of that happening as a young doc was, was really rather frightening. So that's kind of what the climate was like initially. And it was really, again, comforting to be a, a, with a group of docs that valued each other and valued cannabis. Another thing I want to speak about is, is that is not exactly evident in the agenda here is the uncoupling of medical science from medical education. Cannabis has really led the way in medical science for decades. It's awesome what we have been able to learn about the human body and the way it works and the way it modulates and all the things that it does, medically speaking. But it has been really uncoupled to where medical students still do not get an education on cannabis at all and about the endocannabinoid system. I'm talking to people that are coming out of medical schools and residency programs still unaware of what the endocannabinoid system is. This is really egregious. It wow. just shouldn't be. And one of the things that we have an opportunity to do as, a, as an organization is bring the power of, uh, of the law into medical training to say that state institutions, if we have a state college, a state university, we ought to require that there is an education offered to these medical students in the endocannabinoid system and really the, the devil's in the details. It, it's got to be about the pathology and the physiology and so many aspects of, of uh, medical science that needs to be brought to the attention of doctors. And when it happens at state universities, it'll happen from there really throughout the world. But 
I think it, we still need to bring this initiative to the ballot to ask for me medical education in the endocannabinoid system. It's, it's quite obvious from having said what I said that it's the moneyed interests, the institutions, the professional societies, uh, that, and the government itself that has prevented this from ever happening. And the medical school curriculum is fought over minute by minute of your years in medical school as to what you are going to learn. And this is about, are you going to come out of medical school understanding the mechanism of action of some antipsychotic or anti-inflammatory or whatever medicine it might be? This is what is being fought over uh, for the medical students' attention. So again, we have to be able to push on that. There's also, I, I want to echo a, a perennial comment that uh, Fred Gardner has made in O'Shaughnessy's and elsewhere about the clinical trials, the, the randomized controlled trial. This has become the gold standard. But if you really understand what the gold standard is all about, it can be, it is fallible. It can be uh, designed to be fallible and it can be deceitfully made fallible. So pa papers come out that just aren't fair and accurate when it comes to cannabis. And it's, I think, very important for us to be able to, to look to the evidence that the doctors bring to this, to the table. It's the, it's the, the case studies. These don't make it into the books. These don't make it, and most of the time don't make it into the literature, literature at all. But tumors disappear and, and autism comes under control and Alzheimer's disease comes um, under control. And so many things about cannabis that a clinician is going to be aware of are much better under the care with cannabis. And we, we just aren't able to get through the, the issues here about bringing this information to the public. It doesn't make it into the randomized control of trials. They are just simply too expensive and too difficult to set up. And so it's, it's a system that NIH believes we are never going to have to change. They really believe that. I have a resident friend that was there and he said, they have no idea, they have no intention to change, and they don't believe it ever has to change. So we have to be able to bear the pressure on these institutions. We really need to look at cannabis as a therapeutic substance and not as, as a, a substance of drug abuse. So that's one of those issues that we just, uh, it, that's very dear to my heart is the randomized control is not what we need. Uh, well, we do need the randomized control trial, but we have to be respectful of the conferences and the case studies and the information that the physicians really understand. So I, I probably should just stop at this point. I've got about a minute. I want to point out that the law that we have created in Prop 64 here in this state is wonderful to have adult use. It's wonderful to be able to grow plants in your yard. But because of the taxation, the expensive packaging, and on and on, we have really created sort of a monster that makes cannabis often inaccessible to patients. This is really a problem that I see. I can go a, a day at work and just say, that patient is never going to be able to get the medicine I'm asking him to buy because it's just out of range as far as the expense. So I'm one of the docs that continues to do this. Other docs here on the, at the panel are also continuing to work in cannabis medicine. And I thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Jeff. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Some of you may have seen on, on Nova now, streaming on Nova this month, there's a documentary called The Cannabis Question. And all, all the experts come from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the um, the bottom line is only a clinical, the only way to establish truth is a clinical trial. And the, the kinds of data that Dr. Hergenrath and his colleagues have collected on patients' reports of benefit and safety, that's not considered, that's clinical evidence, but clinical evidence is not considered a path to the truth. Only the randomized clinical trial is the path to the truth. And it's, um, 
there's a religious aspect to it. It's it's really wrong, and we've got to we've got to overcome it and keep keep up that struggle. On the uh, on the question of the expense that people have to go through to get their medicine nowadays, uh, we have with us a, a founder of the uh, J Sweet Leaf Joe is is uh, and one of the first people to to give cannabis away in the city, realizing that there were people who couldn't afford it. He's here today to tell us his tale. Thanks for the introduction. I'd like to start by thanking out Nor thanking Normal, uh, Gail Geringer and Ellen uh, for having this event, for being inspirations to all of us over the years. You know, I definitely want to thank the predecessors, you know, Brownie Mary and Dennis Perone, the original compassion activists giving away free cannabis to San Francisco AIDS patients in the 80s. And of course, to Dr. Todd Micaria. And, you know, it's really an honor to be up here on this panel with all of you. Um, Y'all inspire me. You may notice that I'm the youngest person speaking today. <laughs> And that's because I was 20 years old when Proposition 215 passed and I started the Sweet Leaf Collective. Um, I looked up to all of y'all. I mean, Dale remembers me, you know, with my, my patched up pants, a little punk rocker, had my dreadlocks. Um, again, it's, it's an honor. So we're talking a lot about the 90s and, you know, younger people now don't really know what we went through and a lot of people have been talking about it you know we have a lot of shell shock and ptsd and you know i started sweet leaf and we focused primarily on low income terminally ill patients and we were doing bike delivery to their homes and at that time period you know we were all really afraid we did bike delivery because we didn't want a storefront where the federal government could find us. You know, we had a voicemail that I went to public pay phones to check. You know, the, they were coming after doctors like Dr. Todd. I mean, this the, the time period was insane. You know, we're, we're definitely shell shocked. So it's really nice to be able to talk about all this now. You know, um, we had these consortium meetings. I want to say it was in 97. Um, Bill Panzer was like our legal counsel. And, uh, you know, it was scary. We were looking underneath the tables, you know, to find the bugs because we were like, OK, you know, the feds were already in here last night. Right. Like they, they had to hide something. And uh, <laughs> it's great to, to be able to talk about this now. Um, you know, uh, so, again, this is about cannabis activism. Um, compassion is definitely, you know, it's the nonprofit sector of our industry. It's what this all started from and it was really about direct action you know direct action gets the goods people like dennis prone brownie mary was going to jail you know for giving away free weed you know this these are the people who paved the way for all of us you know we're we're following in their footsteps i really believe that with sweet leaf and um let's see what else do i got on here um so, yeah. how, did it, how did it work? How did you get the, the, the marijuana to give away to poor people? Oh, yeah. So we would get donations from growers and we would, you know, pick it up in Humble. We'd bring it down to the bay. We would package it up and we would bike deliver it to people's homes, you know, primarily in the Tenderloin. You know, we're dealing with low income, sick people. Um, and that, that was definitely fun riding around the Tenderloin with a giant bike messenger bag filled with like five pounds of weed. <laughs> You know, just being like, I hope nobody figures out what's in this backpack. I hope. And nobody did, thank God. Um, <laughs> no, because we had a quadruple turkey bag because I run tight game. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm kind of all over the place because of coffee. Um, but yeah, so I'm Sweet Leaf Joe, founder and director of the Sweet Leaf Collective, you know, providing free cannabis to low income terminally ill patients since 1996. We're one of California's oldest cannabis brands. Um, in that time, our patients have received over $4 million worth of free cannabis. 
Yeah, go team. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about, you know, is just like, you know, in the compassion sector, in the nonprofit sector, you know, why we do what we do, because, you know, a lot of us, we don't have a choice to do it. And we're also not really getting paid for it as well. This is, this is a calling. We do it because it needs to be done. These patients need us. This is also why we fought to get SB 34 passed when Proposition 64 passed. And the compassion sector, the nonprofit sector, almost disappeared. And we couldn't let that happen. You know, there's, I've been to countless patients where when we do a delivery, you know, they're in tears. And through their tears, they communicate to us that they would have already passed on if not for this free medicine. You know, it's, it's also not an easy job being surrounded by death. But somebody has to do it. Right. And we are those people. Thanks, Joe. You know, it's it, like I said, it's not a choice. You know, I'm not I'm not here because I want to be here. I'm here because I have to be here. You know, we didn't do interviews for 20 years. This wasn't about me. This is about access for patients. This is why we fight. This is the activism that is still alive and thriving in our industry. It's not a bunch of, you know, just old white guys making all the money. Like there's a bunch of us still here. Nice and um, so I see I got one more minute. One thing I want to ask is if everyone could raise their hand who has participated in compassion in this room. Okay, look around, everybody. See, this is the roots shit. You don't get this at MJ BizCon. You know, this is, these are the real people here. We have done the work. We are continuing to do the work. And I want all of you to know who raised your hand. Together, we are saving lives. Together, we have been saving lives. And this is a really important thing in our industry in this time period because we almost disappeared. And people like us did disappear in Washington, in Oregon, and Colorado. Their nonprofit sectors disappeared. But we fought here. This was for Dennis. This was for Brownie Mary. We weren't going to let compassion disappear. The patients are still there and the patients still need us. So again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, I love all of y'all and keep up the good work. We're going to be joined by one, one more MD who's on his way is Dr. Donald Abrams, who uh, played a very important role in, in the launch of Prop 215. Um, a doctor who was one of the uh, 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 hooked up with Jeff and Todd very soon after Prop 215 passed is Frank Lucido, who's with us today. His office is in Berkeley, and uh, Fra Frank Frank was uh, was the leading uh, representative of the of the pro cannabis doctors in facing the medical board. He created a, a column for O'Shaughnessy's called Med Board Watch put it online and um, let these bureaucrats know that we had a, a community that was gonna stand up for our, our rights. Frank Lucido. Thank you. Um, so uh, I've been in family practice from 1979 till uh, last January. I retired after 41 years doing family medicine. Uh, but in, since 1996, maybe even 1995, I've been doing medical cannabis evaluation. I still do some from home and by televideo. Uh, San Francisco, I'm proud of saying, you know, had a medical marijuana law before Prop 215. So, as you all know, Dennis Broom just uh, needed uh, something documenting the patient's illness and he was given the appropriate medicine. Um, so, early on, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll mention two times that I got to go uh, to the five-story cannabis club. One was when he opened it, and that was before Prop 215 passed. So I, I, I'd met Dennis once or twice, and I, I go in and I introduce myself because he's greeting people at the door in this five-story building, and you know they had a dispensary, they had a disco, they had, I mean, healthcare. It was a, an amazing five-story building, and uh, so I, you know, he greets me at the door, and I said, uh, "This is wonderful." 
place looks great. He says, yeah, we have so many thousand patients. I said, that's great. They looked at me seriously. He says, there's a lot of sick people. And I immediately felt a little bad saying how great it was. But um, and it, it just Dennis was just such a wonderful person. Uh, so that was one time. And so, that, so that, that party was fun. Election Day 1996 now was really fun, okay? So we're all waiting for the, uh, the, the results. The Prop 215 is on the ballot. Um, and at one point we'd heard that, uh, Clinton had just, you know, secured his second term and I'm on the big stairway there and Dennis and some of his friends, uh, had just heard that prop 215 would go over the, over the top, you know, so big old victory joined us happening and somebody yells up and I was about to help participate and somebody yells up, Dennis, the press is here. And I said, Ooh, I'm, I'm not going to be on camera, you know, as a, as a medical doctor that particular day. The next day, I get my very first interview from, you know, one of the local channels and uh, uh, wanting to know how I was going to handle this and, I, you know, ad lib, whatever, because I know that, you know, I knew, I knew there was good for some, a lot of illnesses. I didn't know the extent. I, I didn't know anything about the cannabinoid system. I don't think many doctors knew about the endocannabinoid system. And, uh, you know, in, in this last 25 years, we've learned so much and more has been learned. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, my two times at the uh, at, at the five story club. Um, my my entry into activism though was in 1991. I went to the Nevada test site for the first time to to uh, to uh, protest nuclear testing, and I learned about civil disobedience. You know, before you can cross the line and get arrested, you know, you take a nonviolence training course, and uh, so that first time I did that and, and I walked across the line, got arrested, and, you know, you, you, you learn not to escalate things. And there's peacekeepers there trying to make sure the cops aren't escalating things. So that was one lesson. Then I became an organizer within the within the, the year. And I wasn't intending to get arrested. But at one point, I'm yelling at the cops across the way, you're using a pain compliance hold, you know, trying to get them to stop hurting people. And I get pulled over the line and I learned a very valuable lesson. It was not enough to just know where the line was. You wanted to make sure to step back from it so that you could protect yourself. And that's been one of my biggest pet peeves in seeing the cannabis, many of the cannabis doctors, they stand next on the line or they cross the line and pretend they're not doing it. And those are the ones that got busted and it started giving the thing a bad name. And I was one of the doctors that got investigated by the medical board early on. Um, and, uh, and, and I'd met Dr. Todd before, and I'd met, you know, maybe one or two of the other doctors. But uh, once I got investigated by the medical board, I had to, you know, think of all the names of the doctors that I knew. And, and we gathered, and it had, you know, the name was the, uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a complicated name it, before I called it MedBoard Watch uh, Associated. I, I can't remember what I called it, but, um, it, and, uh, oh, yeah. Attorney Physician Cannabis Medical Legal Group or something because I invited attorneys and and physicians and so uh, out of that we would go to the medical board found out where the quarterly meetings were um, Fred would go there often Dr Todd would come to my house pick up pick me up and we'd drive to Sacramento or wherever the quarterly medical board meeting was and we'd testify about doctors being inappropriately investigated and at one point you, you know the first couple times. Uh, Enough of the medical board members were negative about it, and the, and the, and the, s the staff, which is part of the attorney general's office, uh, you know, were negative about it. But we knew we had some friends on the board. And at a certain point, I'm in the middle of you know, starting my talk, and um, I forgot the name of the medical board member, but he's one of the lay people on the board. Two thirds of them are doctors, one third is medical, uh, are, are, are lay people. And he says, excuse me, Dr. Lucido, this happens every time, but these people, meaning us, get up and talk, and you people, the attorney general's office, sit in the back, smirk, and generally ask, yeah, disrespectful. And I have to wonder why. Now, my father died of, of cancer, and he didn't use marijuana, but I think he could have. So we, we knew we had a friend on the medical board at this point. And then it became obvious that we had more friends when one of the members of the medical board referred patients to me. Um, over the course of the next year. So it was really a good experience of continuing my activism, which began with my anti-nuclear activism. Um, and like I said, most of the time, it was sometime the first time there might have been eight of us going, 
but eventually it was just Fred I and, and, and Dr. Todd and maybe maybe a couple others would, would come. And it, it, it was very um, fruitful and, and important. It sure um, was, Frank. Thank, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you were there filming it. Uh, and Todd, and Todd, was, Todd was always a, had a, a video camera. Oh, that was it too, yeah. 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 And, and Fred, Fred would speak too, and uh, Dr. Todd was so eloquent. Um, and um, one other thing, I was on the on the board of physicians for social responsibility, and one of the issues, you know, so I brought up Prop Two Fifteen. Is going to, you know, we didn't know what the, what it was going to be called uh, at that point because it wasn't on the on the uh, uh, wasn't a proposition yet, but it was we're trying to get it on the board. And I said, I want, I, I'd like the physicians, San Francisco Bay Area chapter of physicians for social responsibility, to uh, to endorse it and. Pretty much everybody wanted to. It's like, well, we can endorse it as an access to healthcare issue. They didn't really have a drug you know, drug war policy, but and so so unanimously we were able to. And I wrote a little op-ed piece, or not an op-ed piece, but a little letter to the editor, and was able to sign it. You know, Dr. Frank Lucido, uh, member of physicians for social responsibility, San Francisco Bay Area chapter. So there were just so many people. Um, probably one of the last things I want to say. Um, so I had not met Dr. Todd McRae at this point. This is still the, the month. This is in the Dr. Uh, uh, Chris Conrad and Mickey Norris are having a fundraiser for Prop 215 to get it on the ballot. And I had not met Dr. Todd, but we'd had a patient in common. He'd come and seen one of my nursing home patients who was uh, depressed and not eating. And um, and we hadn't met, but I'm looking at the note and he he. he you know, right back and forth in the patient's records. And he, he recommended that prescribed Marinol. And I knew that it was a synthetic THC, but I didn't know any doctor that had ever had the nerve to actually prescribe it. And uh, and sure enough, within, a, you know, a couple of days, this woman who's not eating and dwindling away and was depressed is perked up and she's starting to eat. And uh, so I meet Dr. Todd months later, maybe a year later at Chris and Mickey's. And, um, and I said, you know, Frank Lucido, uh, we, doctor, and you saw one of my patients and and uh, recommended uh, prescribed uh, Marinol. You want to go smoke some hash oil? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I went upstairs, and, and that was my first experience with that. So uh, my first meeting of Dr. Todd. Um, just what a wonderful person. And, Thanks, uh, Frank. Thanks, Frank. That's a good number. Well, it so happens that Dr. Beverly Makaria, Todd's uh, younger sister, youngest sister, is is carrying on um, a practice in, and is here today to say a few words on our panel. Dr. Beverly Makaria. Beverly McGuire, and I am also a physician. And when my brother Todd McGuire died after the office had a transient uh, changeover to another practice, it was disastrous. So I, Todd had so many patients that I felt that I could take care of them. So I enlisted some of my, and I had to give Temple University Medical School a little. Uh, credit for this. I had one of my the people who was an other upperclassman and then two of my classmates come and help me see Todd's patients on a regular basis. So we've been doing that since uh, 2007 when he died. And I also have to say that Temple's pharmacology at least holds uh, two hours of lecture on the end of Avalanches. As, as Todd had been advocating from the very first issue of O'Shaughnessy's. Uh, I would just love to talk about Todd a little bit. This, this is the place. Uh, he, he was a man ahead of his time. He, when he was in uh, medical school, he read Goodman and Gilman, which is our pharmacology text. And there, there was a, some footnote referral to uh, cannabis and its use in other cultures. 
So Todd, being the person he was, uh, always curious and uh, controversial, went to uh, many of the countries where it's used medicinally, and he watched to see how it was done. He went to Mexico, he went to Nepal, he went to India, he went to lots of places. Is that better? Oh, I'm sorry. So Todd ended up going to lots of countries where cannabis was a, was a medical uh, remedy. And he became convinced that we were missing out because it had so, so few side effects, could not kill yourself with it. And it had a lot of different properties that were really not utilized in Western medicine. And when Todd, Todd self-published medical marijuana papers in 1973, he finished his research on a certain period of time, the use of the, uh, cannabis, and he put it together and self-published it in 1973. So he was a man ahead of his time, and he was always curious, looking to go forward. Thanks, Bib. Sure was. <clears throat> It gives me particular pleasure to introduce our next speaker because I didn't know he'd still be with us. See, and back in the 96, this time we're, we're talking about, the AIDS epidemic was still at its height. We didn't know that this, what was then being called the three drug cocktail was going, was going to work. And AZT had no, nothing people had been trying had been, been successful. And I had said goodbye to quite a few friends in, in the gay community. And I, I simply assumed that the gay people I knew th th through Dennis in 96 were gonna be gone by now. And when I see Wayne Justman thriving, it's, always, it's to me, it's like a, a, a miracle and a reminder. And there was a guy, I, after Dennis, after Prop 215 passed, Dennis, Dennis did not want to create the industry that's now been created. He wanted to create a different social model. And he said, city people should have access to land in the country. And he, he was a utopian thinker. And he thought that, that the club members should have uh, a place in, in the country where they could actually put their name on a few plants and know how their plants were doing. And he rented 20 acres in Lake County. I asked him, Dennis, why Lake County? Why not Mendocino? And he said, I like Lake County. It's cheap. And and um, and he did. And he did. And they, they started a little farm. These city guys learned how to how to put a plant in the ground and were growing it out. And I drove up there one day with a, a Mike Mac, a, a musician who hung out at Dennis's club. And a big man named Paul Scott, who had worked for an had been in the elevator business, was an engineer, Otis Elevator, huge guy, healthy guy. But I, I just I, I knew he had a positive diagnosis, and I just assumed he was going to be gone. We had a wonderful day, and I liked him very much. And I, I occasionally would, would think, what a shame. If I, 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 never, I knew he had gone down to start a dispensary in L.A. area. But I really got down there, and, and I just assumed he was gone. He walked in today, and I, I, my first thought was, "Gee, it's nice to see a black man in here." There were few black, few black women, and then I thought, "That's Paul Scott." I'm going to get a chair. I'm going to stand up in front of this thing. And as this gentleman said, he's the youngest. I'm probably the only black man in the room. So thank you all for letting me into the family. How I come about this was, my background is, I'm a veteran, I was in the Navy. Um, I, I got a college degree. I worked in the elevator world. I was selling elevators in San Francisco for Otis Elevator Company and I wanted to find some weed. And someone said, well, that'll not be a problem. And they brought me to this club in San Francisco, about five stories and these guys are 
selling weed, and I'm like, you motherfuckers are crazy. <laughs> but I'm gonna get my weed and get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and so that's what that, and then, and then shortly after that, Dennis's club had got shut down, but the rumor was that there was going to be one opening up in Oakland. And so I go across the bridge, and then there's one opening up in Oakland, and then I meet Jeff Jones, and Jeff asked me to be part of his board. And quickly, right away, I see it being racial. Jeff's a white guy. He's interacting with a black guy in the city of Oakland, Nate Miley. And I look at the line of the people that was he was serving, and there were a bunch of broke-down black people. And that's what I see. And I see, like, what is this is not drugs. I mean, we as black people, we don't get access to sesame. And we had a, a shoebox and with the seeds. That's what we were used to. And so when I saw them finally getting access to cannabis, quality cannabis, it had never existed before in our community. And so I saw Jeffrey's efforts in ushering this back and forth with Nate Miley and going back and forth and discussing the logos, and they didn't want this, and I saw how the feds were going to come in and shut it down, and Nate Miley had to do something with the city to declare a state of emergency. Uh, so I saw this interaction that he had in a black city with a black man. And so years, a few years later, I happened to become HIV positive, and I get sick. And I can no longer sell elevators because the drugs that they had us on were horrible. The AZT, the, the uh, Crixivan, and all the things that they had us on with changing my skin color. I was, I was uh, light sensitive. I needed to sit in a room with dark. So I had to do something else. And so I saw what Jeffrey had did in Oakland, and I said, shit, there's a city down in L.A. similarly with similar politics that I can get away with this in L.A. And so I went down to Inglewood. Inglewood. <laughs> and I found Inglewood with a black city councilman and I opened up a store right across the street from City Hall, and there I there I lasted. And then I got the support from Normal, from Bruce Margolin, who came and saved my ass out of jail a few times. <laughs> For free. <laughs> and they all of them came down. And I remember Mike Ackley, he was one of the doctors, who was one of the few doctors. He was one of the few doctors who would write recommendations, but he was very open with his AIDS diagnosis. And so I remember having some black guys in my shop going to get a recommendation, but were hesitant to go in the room and be in touch by Mike Alcalay because Mike Alcalay had AIDS. And they did not want to get touched, but they struggled with, do I get a recommendation or do I let this guy touch me? And so they, I remember them walking out of the room, okay, let him touch me. And so that was a struggle in the early days. And so, again, as a brother, thank you all for allowing me in the family, and Fred Gardner, man, taking me up to meet Dennis, and you all just embraced me, and I was able to take this message south and make it colorful. So thank you for that. I, I, I just wanted to point out, LA was a real desert for cannabis. He had one of only two dispensaries that were operating in LA. The other one was in West Hollywood, catering to the West Hollywood crowd, very selective too, and it got closed down by the federal government. So uh, until about 2006, for the first 10 years, this guy was Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, final speaker is Dr. Donald Abrams. Um, I, when I was at Synapse at UCSF in the early 90s, we reported that uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse had turned down uh, uh, an application by Dr. Abrams and colleagues to do a, a study involving cannabis. We wrote, wrote it up, and either the student who interviewed him or I, I did, he, he, he didn't act angry about it. And I had come from a movement where you got angry readily if you, you were denied anything. And I, I remember going, I sat, I don't know about him, he's so brilliant, but I'm not sure he's, he's, he's really a fighter. And, um, oh, and it took me a, a long time to, to develop what is, it soon became, well, a long time to develop what became a really great respect for Donald Abrams and his 
long game approach to this subject. It's my honor to introduce him. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Sorry I'm late, I got lost, and also I was lecturing to breast cancer survivors on cannabis and cancer care. So we have come a long way. So yeah, my story goes back to 1992, and I wasn't here to hear all the heroes that are mentioned, but I was in Amsterdam at the International AIDS Conference, and I glanced at CNN headline news, and I saw Mary Rathbun being arrested in Sonoma for baking brownies. Mary, Brownie Mary, uh, a hero in my mind, uh, uh, was a volunteer at our AIDS clinic at San Francisco General. She would push the patients to x-ray, drop off their prescriptions, and she would also bake them brownies. So when I got back to San Francisco, there was a letter from Rick Doblin, uh, the founder of MAPS, uh, suggesting that a clinical trial showing the benefit of medical marijuana should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean. So that letter found its way to my office, and I said, okay, I can do that. I went to college in the 60s. And so that started my effort uh, that Fred sort of thinks was a little slow, but it was. Uh, in in 1992, uh, I, said, I sent Rick Doblin the template for how to do a protocol for the UC uh, Institutional Review Board, thinking it would keep him busy for a while. Within one week, he sent me back a protocol to study three different strengths of cannabis brownies in patients with AIDS wasting. I said, I don't think we can study brownies in a clinical trial over eight <laughs> weeks because they're going to go stale. So think of something else. So he got in touch with a company in Amsterdam and they agreed to provide us with three different strains of marijuana to study in this trial. Well, then I got into this little imbroglio with the government saying, no, no, we can't import cannabis unless they say it's okay to export it. So they said they couldn't say it was okay to export it until we said it was okay to import it. So this looked like that Max Escher hands drawing hands print. So I said, oh, I don't know what to do about this. but. Uh, Finally, I have a friend that was sort of high up in the government, and he said, seek a domestic source. So I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, the only legal source of cannabis is NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So, so I sent uh, Alan Leshner, the head of NIDA, a letter uh, with the protocol that we came up with. And it took a year uh, for it, a response. And ultimately, it said uh, that they couldn't provide uh, marijuana for the study because it was unscientific. And that was upsetting. And Rick Doblin and MAPS protested in front of Alan Leshner giving a lecture at the National Institutes of Health, uh, saying that they were <clears throat> stymieing research into medical marijuana. So Leshner said, oh, if Abrams can uh, do a project that's favorably peer reviewed, we may reconsider it. So that means submit a grant to the government. So we decided to do a much more elegant study, not using brownies or Amsterdam cannabis, but 15 patients in our clinical research center incarcerated for one week and then came back two weeks later. And one time they would be smoking cannabis three times a day, the other time placebo. And we we're going to measure every possible thing in these patients with HIV. And we submitted it to the NIH in 1996, of all things. And right before the vote uh, on Prop 215, I got a letter back from NIH saying that the, our protocol was not scored which means that they didn't feel it was worthy of even being ranked. And the two reviewers commented, we don't know why they would consider studying such a toxic substance. And the third reviewer said, well, aren't you concerned that patients with AIDS wasting syndrome are gonna get increased tumor necrosis factor leading to atherosclerosis and potentially death? I said, these are my peers? No, that doesn't make sense. So. This is at the time that the protease inhibitors became available, the new AIDS drug that sort of gave everybody new hope and turned everything around. But there was a report of a patient on a protease inhibitor taking ecstasy who died. And uh, that led me to go to Goodman and Gilman uh, and look in, and I found that the cannabinoids use the same system in the liver that breaks down the protease inhibitors, the HIV drugs. So, oh, I forgot an important point. In 1997, January, I went to the inauguration. Who was that? Clinton, I guess, second time. Yeah. And I met with Alan Leshner because somebody said, you know, you're wearing white hat and black hat. And, you know, there's got to be some in between. So I met with Leshner and I said, 
he said, you know, Donald, we are the National Institute on drug abuse, not for drug abuse. And we cannot provide you with cannabis to study if you're looking for benefit. And I said, well, you know what? I have other things to do in my life. If I do a study that shows that cannabis is not useful or is harmful, I think people are still going to use it. And if I do a study showing that's beneficial and safe, I don't think you're going to change its schedule. And he said, well, you might be wrong there. So that prompted me to go back. And then when that little light bulb went on, that the cannabinoids use the same system in the liver that breaks down the protease inhibitors, I said, okay, we're going to submit a study to see if it's safe for patients on protease inhibitors to inhale cannabis. And as long as I was looking for potential harm, bingo, a million dollars and 1,400 of the government's best joints. So that's how my career started in 1997. And since then, I've done a number of other clinical trials, mainly funded by the California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, which was developed due to uh, the graces of uh, John Vasconcellos, who provided $3 million a year for three years to establish this center that could fund clinical trials in California looking for the potential health benefits of cannabis. They've sort of veered a little towards cannabinoids instead, which upsets me a little because I think the plant is the medicine and dissecting it into little pieces, I don't think is the way to go. So, in the middle of my efforts, I suddenly, uh, Eric Goosby, who became, I think, uh, Obama's AIDS uh, czar at the time, one of my junior colleagues, took me aside. He was affiliated with the government even then. He said, Donald, don't do this. Don't try to study marijuana as a medicine. It's going to ruin your career. Well, my husband, Clint Werner, thought the opposite. Clint, who wrote Marijuana Gateway to Health, uh, said, honey, you have to do it. So I continued to persevere. Clint, not here today, uh, unvaccinated, and actually April 6, 2020, had a grand mal seizure. And when we spoke to his neurologist and she said, absolutely no alcohol, I laughed. I said, he does not drink alcohol, but he smokes a heck of a lot of cannabis. And she said, that's good. So... <laughs> So there you have it. He's very happy with his neurologist. And I'm happy that after 27 years, he, he gave me the right information because, you know, I think I'm really proud at where we are today in this uh, situation. And, you know, I retired, but I'm still looking to turn over a new leaf and push envelopes where they need to be pushed to make health for everybody better. So thank you. That's, that's a great note to end on, and it's been a wonderful panel. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.